Hello and good day everyone. Welcome to um, another installment of our Bible study series um, going through the New Testament and we have come to the letter to the Hebrews. Now I have put letter there with a question mark after it. That is not a mistake um, as we'll see soon. But um, it's often titled uh, the letter to the Hebrews and so uh, we'll call it that here. Uh, Hebrews is a very interesting book. Um, it is probably uh, the least understood book in the entire New Testament. Uh, I've seen it compared to um, something like a foreign art film around uh, those of you who watch um, and or keep up with movies around um, the awards time, the Golden Globes or the Academy Awards. Um, every once in a while there will be yeah, some foreign film, okay, it's not even in English, and it'll be this super arty film, you know, where they're exploring these, you know, advanced concepts of filmmaking, and um, it will get, this film will get a lot of attention around awards season, and then you don't hear anything about it afterwards. Um, you've never heard about it in the box office, it probably didn't even open in a general release in the cinemas, uh, but, you know, yeah, for a while there, you hear a lot about it. It might get a whole bunch of awards, and then nobody thinks about it afterwards. It makes really little money. It doesn't make any kind of dent in the culture. Um, and it's only talked about by people like um, film critics or people who vote in these kinds of things. I've seen Hebrews compared to something like that, okay? Um, Hebrews, it, it's a very interesting book it's very carefully crafted it is it's obviously it, um, been something that the author has taken a great deal of time on there are a lot of quotations from the old testament uh, references to things like hellenistic philosophy a uh, greek philosophy uh, there's even some evidence that this is the first christian uh, Platonist, okay, uh, from taking some ideas from Plato and other Greek philosophers and then applying it to sort of Christian beliefs. Very well argued, um, just e extremely elegant um, Greek. If you read it in the Greek, it's very elevated language. Um, so it's obviously, I mean, this is a work of art. Um, it is a work of, truly a work of literature that we have in the Bible. But um, as, you know, as carefully crafted as it is, as, as well put together as it is, you know, as um, sophisticated as the arguments are, there are very few memory verses that come out of Hebrews. Uh, there, there are a few, uh, right? You've got uh, from Hebrews chapter 4, you've got uh, the statement that Christ was in every aspect like we are. He was tempted like us so that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Um, that's a fairly... Uh, popular uh, statement from this book. And of course you have Hebrews chapter 11, um, the, the, the great um, by faith chapter. Uh, but aside from those, Hebrews is not going to be typically something that a lot of people quote from. Um, it, is, it is partially because the language is so elevated, um, because it is kind of academically heavy um, you have these, as I noted here, you have these obscure references, okay, or some very difficult arguments to follow. Um, things like, you know, getting very deep into Jewish sacrificial rites, um, things that went on in the Old Testament of the Mosaic Tabernacle. Um, you have, of course, the Heavenly Sanctuary, which is important to Adventists, but which I would guess even the majority of Adventists don't understand very well. And then you have this entire discussion about the priestly order of Melchizedek, this uh, character that only appears in a couple of places in the Bible, and um, therefore you know, there's not a lot to, to hang on with that. Um, it, the, the author makes a very, again, you know, a, a very um, well done argument about Christ being in Melchizedek's line, but we don't really know who Melchizedek was. Um, if you haven't, you know, really studied um, the stories in Genesis, you might even not not even know who this is. And so, yeah, you know, Hebrews, it's not very well understood. 
not super popular in terms of you know uh, signs that you would hold up at a football game or um, what yeah memory verses that would get put into a Christian uh, game that we would play with our kids uh, but yeah anyway this book is still very important and uh, let's get into it some uh, the historical background of the work first of all the author is anonymous we have no idea who wrote this i believe the king james bible has said that this is the letter of paul to the hebrews but that is almost certainly inaccurate um we, it, it, we certainly don't know who it is and um, there's some significant differences between the way that paul writes and um, the way that hebrews is written normally first of all um, most obvious paul typically will begin his letters by stating his name, uh, Paul to uh, this church, or in the cases of the pastoral letters that we studied last week, or the, the letter to Philemon, you know, Paul to this certain person, Paul to Timothy or Titus. We don't have anything like that. Um, the letter does not start off with the typical conventions of a letter, which is why I put letter with a question mark at the beginning. Uh, this does not actually look like it was a letter, uh, and it almost certainly was not written by Paul. So who is it written by? Well, you know, we have we do have this tradition that states that it was Paul. So possibly that that's somebody to consider. Other possibilities are on the slide. Okay, you have Apollos, who is mentioned in both Acts and the letters of Paul. And uh, Apollos is known for being very eloquent and a very good speaker, and that would certainly match up with what we find here in Hebrews. Uh, Luke, the physician, who is said to have written um, Luke and Acts, which coincidentally are also anonymous, uh, but you know, kind of match up with that. Luke and Acts, as we mentioned when we covered those books, are very, again, elevated, elegant, Greek, and uh, very good writing, and so, hey, maybe Luke, Luke wrote this book as well. Uh, Barnabas, one of Paul's companions from early on in Paul's career as a missionary, has been suggested. And a very interesting one um, here is Priscilla, frequent companion of Paul. I mentioned her in some of, along with some of the letters of Paul. A very important person in Paul's life, um, Priscilla and her husband Aquila, they, um, yeah, they were frequent companions of Paul. They were co-workers of his. Um, he, he mentions that they, they saved his neck a few times. And uh, interestingly enough, Priscilla and Aquila are also mentioned in conjunction with Apollos. Uh, and so if we take that Apollos was a very eloquent speaker and um, you know, a very good orator, it may have been Priscilla and Aquila who had something to do with um, you know, giving him that that ability or bringing that out. Um, certainly, they were the ones who uh, educated him in Christianity, uh, and so yeah, maybe you know, it, it may even have been Apollos writing, but with a lot of input or inspiration from Priscilla and Aquila. And so we have yeah, and you know, uh, people have suggested that this may have been actually Priscilla who wrote this, which would be very interesting. Um, you know, yeah, one of the only uh, Bible books that was written by a woman, possibly. Um, but yeah, you, you, possibilities are, are limitless, right? It may have been somebody that we've never heard of and never shows up in the New Testament record. But again, yeah, anonymous writer, and so we don't know. What we can get from the book is that the audience are certainly Christians, uh, probably Jewish Christians, hence the name the Hebrews. Uh, the author goes a lot into Jewish rituals, Jewish practices, and even quotes some things from Jewish history, name drops some famous people from Jewish history. And so, yeah, almost certainly these, this would have been written to an audience that knew about that, okay, that was familiar with those names and those practices. Uh, the author does not really... Uh, explain a lot of these things and so yeah you know, your audience probably has previous knowledge of this but also uh, this 
displays a lot of uh, reference to Greek philosophy and kind of this rhetorical style we know from um, other records, not, not Bible records, that the Greeks really did appreciate, you know, or they had this almost science of rhetoric and persuasion. And this author very much demonstrates um, a, a familiarity and a knowledge with that, employs a lot of arguments from philosophy and Greek rhetorical styles. So likely, um, this was a Hellenistic Christian, a Hellenistic Jew. In other words, a Jewish person who had gone out into, you know, the, the Roman Empire, had left kind of Jerusalem and Palestine and gone out into the empire and was likely educated in these um, Hellenistic traditions, but still had that background in Judaism and would have been kind of addressing this um, this work to other people with a similar background. Probably Jews, but Hellenistic Jews who you know, were well versed in kind of the culture of the greater society and, and the Roman Empire. Major question when we consider the historical um, significance and the historical background of this was when was this work written? Um, chapter 2 verse 3 uh, just open, comes out and says that um, you know, we heard about uh, Jesus from other people. And so these were not people who had first-hand knowledge, uh, but instead were almost certainly second-generation Christians, not third, fourth generation. Uh, that's not the kind of um, you know impression that we get. But um, yeah, likely uh, second-generation Christians who heard about it from the eyewitnesses. So this is putting us, yeah, you know, maybe a generation removed from uh, the life of Jesus and um, the testimony, the very first uh, testimonies and activities of the apostles. Uh, we have some references in Hebrews to sacrifices, uh, and it seems like the author is talking about sacrifices as if they're still ongoing, uh, that they are being offered in some kind of religious setting, which would mean that this was written before AD 70. If you remember, that is a very significant date in New Testament studies. That is when um, the Romans besieged Jerusalem, um, entered it, destroyed Jerusalem, and completely annihilated um, the, the Jewish temple. And so at that point, um, there's no more temple, sacrifices have stopped, um, all of the people associated with the temple have been killed off. And so, yeah, if we're talking about sacrifices still being a thing and still being in the process of being offered, this is definitely going to be before AD 70. However, some people point out that um, that might have been kind of a, one of these rhetorical uh, devices that the author is, is using. Uh, the temple is never mentioned. Uh, and so, you know, hey, maybe the temple was destroyed. Okay, we're not talking about the Jewish temple, which would have been the thing that was closer. Instead, whenever we're talking about Jewish rituals and religion, all of the references that are used in Hebrews are references to the tabernacle, this kind of portable tent that was carried around and deployed with the Ark of the Covenant uh, when you know, Moses led the people out of, of Egypt to the Promised Land. So people, are, look, people look at that and they say, hey, maybe we are talking about a time after the temple was destroyed. And so possible dates that have been given uh, from the early kind of end would be around the 50s when um, you know, Paul and these missionaries started really um, stepping up their activity and starting to you know, take the gospel out from uh, Palestine and Jerusalem to around uh, the 90s which would be the end of the New Testament writing period. So basically, the possible dates for Hebrews cover the entire period of the New Testament. So that's not incredibly helpful. But you, know, you have these uh, a few possibilities here, maybe 50 to 70 if you believe that it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, and maybe around 70 to 90 for those who think it was later and after um, the destruction of the temple. So yeah, again, I said at the beginning, 
we don't understand a lot about this book. Uh, not a lot of definitive historical evidence or anything that we can use to, to hook this work in a certain place or even time. So let's get then into the major themes in Hebrews, which will probably be uh, a bit more uh, practical and we can get a little bit more out of that. I've found four major themes in reading through Hebrews and I've put them up here. Okay, first of all, you have this very strong emphasis on the superiority of Christ. Um, Hebrews, again, as I said, it doesn't open like a letter, so that's why we don't think it even was a letter. It may have been a sermon or kind of a religious tract that was put out by somebody to you know, explain um, what people believe, what Christians believe, and also to pass around to Christian uh, communities and encourage them to stay faithful. So that's what we think Hebrews was was probably you know, written as. Definitely not a letter because it just goes straight into uh, this argument about how Christ is superior to Jewish history, uh, the the revelation of the prophets, uh, superior to angels, and so yeah, we're we're definitely putting that Christ is superior to all um, previous religious experiences that people have had. Um, previous religious writings, um, the, saying that the Old Testament, God spoke um, to the Old Testament writers, but now he's spoken to us through his son, which is a much better revelation. Okay, and so saying that, yeah, Christ is, is the greatest. Christ is superior to everything that has come before. Um, Hebrews has a strong emphasis on um, hold on to your faith. Um, avoid apostasy. All right. Um, it even comes out very strongly and says things like people who fall away from their faith, people who reject uh, the faith that they once knew and accepted, they can't come back. And it almost seems like, you know, once you walk away from this, you cannot come back in and become a Christian again. And you're almost like it's almost like you're lost forever. All right. Um, and we do know that. Um, historically, there were some of these tensions between um, Christian communities when there would be a lot of persecution, okay, and people would get thrown into prison. Um, sometimes people would get executed in you know, um, extreme circumstances, but a lot of times people were just thrown into prison and held in very um, harsh condi conditions. Uh, occasionally, you had bouts of things like um, torture and interrogation. And um, what would what would then happen is some people, some Christians would hold to their faith and they, they would not break under these conditions, you know, imprisonment, torture, even threats of death. But then others would would break and they would they would renounce their faith and they they you know um, be released and go about their lives. But then maybe later on when the persecution kind of dies down, these people then wanted to come back into into the fellowship. And there was this big debate among Christian communities as to what do we do with these people. Um, you had people called confessors. Those were the ones who suffered the torture, who suffered the imprisonment, who you know maybe saw their friends and family murdered for faith, but you know for whatever reason they um, persisted and they were able to um, they were able to live until they were released. These people were called the confessors, and maybe ironically, these confessors were the ones who argued most passionately for the backsliders and the apostates who left the religion when things got tough, okay? And then now they come back and they wanna come back into the, the community. It's the confessors, the people who survived the worst and they never, um, they, they never renounced their faith. They were the ones who most passionately argued that these people should be let back in. Uh, you know, you think that um, the people who suffered the most and you know, they lost the most and they saw friends and family be killed, you'd think that they would take the hardest line against this and say, look, you know, we, we suffered it, we, you know, we held fast, these people, they broke and they shouldn't be let in. No, actually, it was completely the opposite. It was those people who went through it who said, you know what, it's the hardest, it, it was the hardest thing. We know how difficult it was, we know how painful it was, but... 
um, you know, and, and so therefore we have sympathy for these people who couldn't who couldn't make it, um, you know, and, and now they're wanting to come in, and we should let them back in. Well, Hebrews is taking kind of the opposite um, tack to that. Hebrews really comes out and says, like, if you leave the faith, you're not worthy to be let in, and um, you can you can never come back in. Okay, and so the, the very strong line that Christians need to hold on to their faith even when we're suffering, even when things get bad, because. Uh, suffering teaches us to be obedient to God. Suffering um, produces perseverance and it produces strength and character. And you have to be faithful to Jesus. You have to follow the example of Jesus who suffered the most of anybody. Okay, And uh, because of his experience in suffering, he then became our high priest. He then becomes our example. And so we have to follow Jesus. Okay, so some interesting stuff in Hebrews, especially if you know kind of what was going on behind the scenes. Now, whether Hebrews was, was, was written in this kind of context, okay, whether Hebrews was written to this debate about what do we do with apostates, we don't know. Uh, but, yeah, you know, we do know that that was a major debate within Christianity. What do we do with people who left the faith, under, especially under hardship, and should they be let back in? Okay, Hebrews says no. Some other Christian, um, some other Christian sources say yes. So those were some uh, themes in Hebrews. Now, what else can we say about, especially like Christian Christianity and Judaism? What do we see? What do we learn about um, this relationship between the two religions and the two faiths from Hebrews? Well, Hebrews starts out and says. Jesus and the God of the Jews are the same, all right? Very beginning of Hebrews uh, presents Jesus as uh, divine, as like the exact, pretty much the exact copy of God. Uh, and this is significant because there were some traditions um, in early Christianity that kind of said that Judaism was almost evil. Okay, and the God of the Old Testament was angry and capricious and you know, um, arbitrary, and we have to really separate from that. And we're not Jews. We are just worshiping Jesus, and Jesus was this perfect revelation from God. Well, Hebrews says no, and Hebrews really makes a connection between th and that puts Jesus centered in Judaism. Okay. Um, it, author quotes the Old Testament often uh, to make their point, and so treats the Hebrew Bible as something that is still authoritative. Um, in order to understand the revelation of Jesus, you have to understand some of these things that are written in the Old Testament. And so we're not rejecting our Jewish background. We're not rejecting um, the Hebrew Bible, but instead, you know, we're saying that Jesus was a better revelation. Um, Hebrews very much yeah, affirms that Christians and Jews come out of the same tradition, that Jesus was a Jew, that Jesus was you know, um, the reflection of this Old Testament God, and that we as Christians, we read the same Bible and we, we're citing the same sort of scriptural tradition to get our belief in Jesus. We just, yeah, we just emphasize something different you know, in who is the Messiah, how do we know that? Again, um, I mentioned that a theme of Hebrews is that Christ is supreme and Christ is the best revelation. Um, Hebrews makes the argument that Jesus is superior to these great names, these VIPs from Jewish history. Uh, you have um, people mentioned by name, okay, Moses in chapter 3, Joshua and Aaron in chapter 4, Levi in chapter 7. And so with this, the author is yeah, making their case that Jesus is superior to all of even these, you know, great leaders and great heroes from Jewish history. Comes out very strongly right at the beginning and states that Jesus is superior to the angels. Uh, again, the revelation is greater than the prophets and all of the Old Testament writings. Uh, the salvation that Jesus brings, not just the revelation that Jesus brings of God, but the salvation that Jesus gives to us and um, you know what Jesus' life and death give to us is greater. It is, in fact, more complete 
than even the salvation that was anticipated and experienced by the Israelites in, uh, in, in the Old Testament writings. Uh, Jesus is the great high priest in that heavenly sanctuary. Okay? And we talk about the heavenly sanctuary a lot in chapter 9. Um, the heavenly sanctuary is the real thing. The heavenly sanctuary is the thing that matters. Um, Hebrews comes out and says that, yes, we have this earthly tabernacle, and we had the services, we had the sacrifices, everything that went on there, but all of those things um, are just a reflection or a copy or a shadow of the things that are going on in the heavenly sanctuary. And of course, those of you who are Adventists and grew up in the Adventist church who you know, have education in Adventist beliefs, this became really important to Adventists, right? As we were trying to understand um, the great disappointment and what happened there. But yeah, you know, this idea that we can study what happened in the Old Testament and all of those things that are going on, and they still have some relevance to us because they are reflections of this heavenly sanctuary, which we as Adventists believe things are still going on up there. All right, and um, yeah, Christ is the supreme revelation. Christ is the best revelation and the best salvation. But um, Hebrews says that Jewish things, um, Jewish religion, Jewish practices, they're not, it's not that they're bad, it's not that they're evil, all right, but it's that Christ is better, and so that's why we're, that's why we follow Jesus. It's not that we, you know, are wanting to completely divorce ourselves from Jewish beliefs and practices, but just that we found something that's even better and that builds on the truths that have been revealed in Judaism. Okay. It's just that, again, Christ's revelation is fuller and more complete and a superior revelation. One thing that's very interesting about Hebrews, it is one of the most complete statements in the New Testament uh, where we get this um, idea, this doctrine of the dual nature of Christ. Okay. This really difficult um, thing to understand, um, especially, yeah, you know, for new believers, okay, we say that Jesus, was Jesus 50% human and 50% divine? No, it's bad math, but we say Jesus is 100% divine, 100% God, and 100% human. Okay. And there are statements to this effect that you see um, in, the, in various places in the New Testament. Okay, Paul makes some statements, um, John, the Gospel of John makes some statements, Jesus even makes some claims on his own behalf. Okay, but it's not really spelled out. It's kind of um, referred to, you know, at kind of at an angle, you know, or just these short kind of statements where, you know, somebody will say something about Jesus either being like fully human or fully divine. It's not until we get to Hebrews that we really get this combination of these ideas and stated pretty much as something that Christians have to believe. All right, uh, stating that Jesus, first of all, Jesus is totally divine, okay? Jesus is the exact imprint of God's being, okay? A reflection of God's glory. And this is not saying that, you know, a reflection in terms of something that is inferior or false, okay? This is actually talking about, like, a mirror image of Christ, of God's glory. You look at Jesus, and it's like you're looking at God in a mirror, okay? You're looking at God from a, from another angle, and, and now you're seeing Jesus, like, and, and yeah, it's like you're looking at God in, in this, as this mirror image, okay? Um, stating very clearly that Christ is superior to the angels, in fact, worshipped by them, all right, and you know we know that in Jewish tradition you do not worship anything except God. Okay, God alone is worthy of worship, and so if the angels are worshiping Christ, then yeah, Christ is worthy of worship. Therefore, Christ is equated with God. Um, Christ is said to be without sin, um, and also returning to save those who are eagerly expecting Him and waiting for Him. All right, and so yeah, um, seated at the right hand of God, uh, coming back to take us um, to to heaven and save us. So very strongly, Jesus is divine. Jesus is God. Okay, but then also coming out equally strongly and saying Jesus is fully human too. Um, Jesus was made of flesh and blood. Um, Jesus is like us in every single respect. 
Um, and so therefore he understands us. He understands what it's like to be human, um, what it's like to be weak. Um, chapter four, it says that we are, he was tempted just as we are, but he remained without sin. Okay. Um, it even says that Christ learned obedience through his suffering, which is a really interesting thing to say about Jesus, right? If Jesus was divine um, and Jesus, you know, had this divine nature, how could he learn anything if, you know, he, well, he's God, he knows everything. Well, it said that actually he learned obedience. And again, this is probably that, um, that sense of, you know, not being ignorant, but just that he got more, okay, he, he, he got a superior understanding of what it means to be like, obedient to God because he suffered as, as a human being. And through this, um, through this suffering, that produced even more obedience and devotion in the human Jesus. Therefore, we have this example that we can follow. Even when we are suffering, even when we're going through difficult things, we can know that um, you know Jesus walked this way before. He knows what it's like, but he's there to help us and to um, you know encourage us and to give us the strength to face whatever we are facing. Another idea that is interesting that we have in Hebrews and really no place else. Um, this is this is something this is an idea that we only get in the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is our high priest or Jesus is the high priest in this heavenly sanctuary all right uh, normally this is not the case uh, this is not the typical uh, picture of Jesus Jesus is usually portrayed as as a sacrifice okay the sacrificial animal that gets offered on the altar not the high priest who's doing the sacrificing but here in Hebrews, it comes out and says, no, Jesus is the high priest. Um, yeah, people who were familiar with this would have been like, no, Jesus wasn't a priest. He couldn't have been a priest because, um, you know, if you're talking about the tabernacle services, if you're talking about Jewish religion and rituals, um, he couldn't have been the priest because he was not from the tribe of Levi and Le the Levites were the priests. Well, Hebrews gets around this by saying that Jesus, no, Jesus was not a priest through the Levitical line, but he was a priest through the line of this character, Melchizedek, who only appears again in Genesis chapter 14 and Psalm 110. Um, there's this, yeah, the Psalm, a song that the Jews used in their, in their services um, that re actually references this character of Melchizedek again. And says that, yeah, you know, Melchizedek was, was this priest and, you know, you are a priest along his line and this line will never end. Hebrews takes this and runs with it and says, well, Jesus was a priest through Melchizedek's line. Convenient because um, we don't have any record of Melchizedek having any descendants. We don't have any record of Melchizedek ever dying. Uh, so we don't know anything about his line. And so Hebrews comes out and says, this is the line through which, or the tradition through which Jesus gets this priesthood. And Hebrews again will say, take a look at this and say, this is again why Jesus is superior. Because Melchizedek was living during the time of Abraham and therefore before the Levitical priesthood. And so, you know, was a priest before even um, God ordained the Levites to be the priests. Also, Abraham, the founder of the nation, right, the father of, of Israel, he paid a tithe to Melchizedek, so therefore it shows that Melchizedek was superior. So yeah, um, Hebrews makes this claim about Jesus and says Jesus is a high priest through Melchizedek's line, so therefore it's greater than the Levitical line, and so you should follow Jesus. Therefore, in Hebrews, Jesus becomes both the high priest who gives the sacri who, who administers the sacrifice, as well as the sacrifice itself. Okay, Jesus is the high priest, and in this really strange um, metaphor, this kind of double doubling down on this idea, you know, Jesus takes his own blood and offers it on the altar. Right. Um, and of course, Jesus's blood is this once for all sacrifice. Famous line from Hebrews, you know, the blood of animals uh, can never take away sin. 
Uh, but it so Jesus gave us his own blood that takes away you know this need for sacrifice it takes away sin once and for all Christianity is very much portrayed as a journey in Hebrews uh, again referring to the tabernacle instead of the temple which is significant right because the tabernacle was this portable tent that um, the Israelites carried around um, and not the temple that was that had a foundation and was set okay and so this is emphasizing that our experience um, our you know kind of as you know, if you want to call Christianity like the new Israel the experience of the new Israel is this portableness okay it's this journey it's this movement from our reality here to uh, the promised land and the city that God is prov is providing for us um, Hebrews gets a lot into, um, again, you know, these famous um, examples from Jewish history, uh, the patriarchs taking journeys like Abraham, um, Moses and the Exodus, um, Joshua and Aaron and Levi, all of these, all of these um, characters, you know, that, that were associated with, with journeys and um, movement. And these are representations then of our spiritual journey to um, what God has prepared. The good, that's the good news. Um, God has prepared a place for us and that we are progressing to that. The bad news is that um, as we take this journey, we are going to suffer and we're probably going to suffer a lot, um, Hebrews says. But Hebrews, again, it characterizes this suffering and opposition as... Um, first of all, evidence that we are progressing uh, in, in um, understanding of God and progressing towards that um, city of salvation, but also that we are growing you know, in our obedience to God and um, our, yeah, our experience, our maturity as Christians. Okay? And so, yeah, uh, a journey, but it's a journey with, um, yeah, with resistance, a journey with difficulty. But Hebrews would come out and say, hey, look, you know, you don't build muscle if you don't use resistance, right? Um, this is important, and, um, and yeah, we need to stay faithful even if we're suffering. Honestly, um, reading through Hebrews, there are some definite difficulties in this book. There's a reason why it's not super popular, and people are not quoting a lot out of it as memory verses. Okay. Um, you have these doctrines of Christology, okay, these doctrines of who Jesus was, and they're kind of difficult, kind of academic, um, maybe not the most important thing if you're talking about, like, the Christian experience, um, you know, talking about, yeah, is Jesus 100% God, is Jesus 100% human? Uh, and so, therefore, yeah, that's a really academic kind of thing, you know, um, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin kind of discussion. Um, but you also have this emphasis on um, Jesus is better than the Jewish religion. Jesus is better than the Jewish prophets. And you, people have taken that in a really bad direction. Okay? And it has been the basis for a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of racism, a lot of even violence against Jewish people. And it's this idea of, that we call supersessionism. You know, that Christians are now the, uh, the the new Israel. We have replaced the Jews as God's chosen people. And therefore, yeah, the Jews now are rubbish and we can treat them a as such. Okay, And that's really led to some bad stuff and, and some, frankly, evil things that are done in the name of Jesus. And unfortunately, yeah, some of it has its statement and its basis here in Hebrews. And so we need to be careful with that. Okay, and to remember that Hebrews is saying that it's not that Judaism is bad or that it's evil. It's saying here is why we are following Jesus. Here is why we believe that Jesus is a better revelation. Okay, but it's not saying again that Judaism is worthless or that we can just treat Jews terribly. I mentioned this before, but um, there are some really harsh statements about apostasy and falling away that are kind of hard to read and they actually go against 
Um, even some of the early Christian traditions that we have, again, it was some of those people who actually survived and um, stayed faithful to the calling of Jesus, who then turned around and said, we need to be merciful and understanding to people who have fallen away and, um, and to people who, who we might call apostates. Um, Jesus was, you know, the reason why we suffered for Jesus was because Jesus is loving and we found something better. And so we need to welcome these people back. And in light of that, it's hard to read some of these statements in Hebrews that say, yeah, you know, there's no possibility of repentance. Um, I put here, yeah, you know, th these warnings and these statements are even at odds with the Gospels. Okay, you have the prodigal son as a perfect, um, you know, counter argument to this, right? Um, the prodigal son knew his father, was there with his father, left the father and turned completely turned his back on his father. As soon as he came back, the father was like watching at the gate in the distance to welcome him back, right? Um, you have Peter's denial of Jesus. Um, Paul makes some statements, you know, that, hey, you know, if we fall away, that, you know, we, we need to welcome people back. Um, God is merciful. Um, even talks about the Jews as a, is a big picture in um, these weird chapters in Romans that we never read from. Um, and says that God, no, God wants to save them. And um, God's mercy hasn't run out on them. Um, God still loves the people of Israel and he's wanting to save them. Okay, and so, yeah, you know, what, what do we do with that? <clears throat> well, clearly, um, Hebrews was written to a time, and again, we don't really have a great understanding of when, but Hebrews was written to a time and a context and to certain people. And this was something that was important to this community. I think when we're talking about how do we think about our community now and how we relate to people, especially people who have left, we need to take the whole Bible into consideration, okay? And, and it can be really dangerous. This is a perfect example of how dangerous it is to take like one section of the Bible out and say, we're going to make our entire church policy around like six, six verses right here, okay? Um, and, and you need to take the entire Bible into account and say, you know what? It is important to be faithful and Christians need to be faithful. Christians need to stick to it even when it gets hard. Uh, but at the same time, we need to emulate Jesus and what Jesus said about God. And we need to show mercy and we need to show kindness and understanding. All right. So those are some things um, that I got from reading um, the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews, it, I highly recommend that if you haven't read it for a while, you do. It's, a, again, a very well-crafted argument, kind of an early, almost, uh, example of what we call Christian apologetics. Not saying sorry, but actually apologetics is like laying out a rational case for why we believe this, okay? Stating not just what we believe, but why, okay? And Hebrews is a very good statement of that. It's a very good example of an early Christian example of this. Um, foundational to some of our, what we call orthodox understandings about um, Jesus's nature and just exactly who Jesus was. Um, if you're Adventist, really important stuff, right, about heavenly sanctuary and Jesus as a high priest. Um, you know, again, this is something that's being lost, I believe, in Adventism. Uh, people about my generation uh, started really walking away from this and, and, you know, most people like my age don't even care about this and you know it's only accelerated as you go on uh, people who are younger than me probably have no idea how to um, you know e explain this and so if you want to get you know where Adventists get this belief that's kind of strange and kind of out there well read Hebrews and that that's it's all about that um, and then this idea of a journey and, and specifically a journey that's taken in community is a powerful thing. Um, Hebrews 11 really comes out and says like, you know what, if you're struggling, if you're suffering, we have this example in Jesus, but not only do we have Jesus to follow, you are part of a community of believers throughout all of history and all of time. We are surrounded, as Hebrews says, by a great cloud of witnesses. Do not ever feel like you're alone. Don't ever feel like you have to do this alone and you have to suffer alone. 
because you have Jesus' example, but you also have Abraham, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, by faith you know Samson and Gideon and Barak and all of these people, okay? Um, you're part of this, and you have a community of people who care about you and who have done this before, and so therefore you can do it too. Powerful stuff, all right? And saying that you keep your eye on the prize, you keep your eye on that city that God has prepared that's a greater city it's a better it's a better citizenship okay and this is something that you know we can certainly take in these difficult times as a lot of people are suffering just remember as we're separate from each other as we're you know feeling alone and isolated that even now you are part of a great cloud of witnesses and this enormous um, community and fellowship that has happened throughout all of history and that God has been leading from the very beginning until the end, Christ, the author and finisher of our, of our faith, another great statement from Hebrews, okay? and that God will, Christ will take you through. God is leading us. God is leading us on this journey. All right, um, some thoughts on Hebrews, and I'll uh, come back next week for, um, I believe maybe the book of James will be covering uh, some interesting stuff there. Uh, join us if you can for our worship service uh, Saturday morning at 11.10. And uh, blessings to everyone. I hope you're having a great week. And um, we'll see you again. All right. Blessings to everyone. Bye-bye.